This is the Badass Dad Pod, where we quest to live our best lives relationally, physically, and financially, no matter what age we are. Welcome to the squad, fellow badass. This episode, we're diving into the mindset of our kids. How is their world different from the world we encountered when we were kids? We're going to use the Marist Mindset List for the class of 2024 to get a step inside the minds of our youngins and how their world experience differs from ours. I'll be your tour guide through this experience. My name is Ryan Dunn. I am the quester of dad jokes, the prince of plyometrics, the money miser of old hickory, a level six relationship ranger, a level seven gym warrior, a level three debt mage, and your lawful good podmaster. I was born in 1975. I graduated high school in 1994, the year of the Tanya Harding influenced attack on figure skater Nancy Kerrigan, the year in which South Africa held its first multiracial elections, resulting in Nelson Mandela becoming the country's president. OJ Simpson had his famous slow mo white Bronco car chase in 1994. NAFTA went into effect. The world's first satellite TV service began. (laughs) Need I repeat that? The world's first satellite TV service began. Netscape Navigator. Ugh. Some of you just grunted out loud. I heard you. Netscape Navigator was the leading web browser. Uh, There was no Google. And most of us actually did not have consistent access to the internet anyway. Big movies were Forrest Gump, Dumb and Dumber, Pulp Fiction and Speed, all timeless, am I right? And the biggest music hits included I'll Make Love to You by Boys to Men, Fantastic Voyage by Coolio, Come Along and Run. Anyway, uh, Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden, Hold My Hand by Hootie and the Blowfish, and Madonna's I'll Remember, oh, and also Closer by Nine Inch Nails. Green Day, hey, you heard of them? They released their debut album. It's called Doogie. That stuff probably isn't super relevant. (laughs) It was just a lot of fun for me to pull that info up. Well, and that's the world into which I entered adulthood. But I'll tell you what, I think some of the technological details might help to frame things a bit. For example, 1994 was the first year that I had access to email. We didn't really have online gaming in those days. Instead, we did these things called LAN parties. So my friends would run a physical cable, mind you, from one computer to another in order to shoot at each other in Doom, which was the first popular first-person shooter game. But most of the time, you know what? We just played each other on our Sega Genesis's or our Super Nintendos. Cell phones, the things that really uh, seem like born in the hand of every human being now. Well, in those days, they were really just for the rich. And by that, I mean the super rich. For example, when I entered college, I didn't know of a single student who owned a cell phone. Well, check that. Maybe I did. I might have known one or two, but they generally kept their phones in the trunks of their cars and their phones were only to be used for emergencies. Nobody was walking around with those things in their pockets. We still had corded phones on the walls in our dorm rooms. And I realize that this makes me sound really miserly and old. So uh, <laughs> hey, let's get to talking about the younger generation, shall we? According to the Marist's Mindset List. And this is an annual list generated by Marist College to describe the incoming freshman class. So According to them, the artists and designers of the class of 2024 will explore race relations beyond Black Lives Matter in order to dive into a deeper understanding of how whiteness has shaped bias and culture in America. Now, whiteness hasn't been a word for many of us for most of our lives. Like the null curriculum, the unstated curriculum, the unstated things that we taught for people of my age, when it came to race relations, was something called colorblindness, which really is just a denial of race issues. 
actually it's it's whitewashing and i mean that in a racial way in this case because it leads to white cultural exceptionalism which i believe is the most common form of racism present today like most people don't have a problem with people of color for their appearance instead we harbor prejudices against people who don't sound or act white and um uh, I'm guilty of that. So I rejoice that our younger generation is addressing the whitewashed mentality and that they're willing to celebrate a more diverse vision for the nation. This next generation has always been connected through mobile smart devices. So they rely primarily on those devices for shopping, for inter-wellness-centered consumer experiences and for engaging in the social good. And of course, the events of this past year, the pandemic year, have certainly heightened those reliances. It's likely that this generation will look to digitally engage first in activities that people of my generation assumed really could only be done through face-to-face -face interaction. Like, for example, doctor's visits. It's likely that an online consultation will be normative for this generation prior to an in-person visit. Though it's something of a novelty to someone of my age. Working out is moving in that direction too. A community workout experience used to involve showing up to a room with like a dozen other people and sweating together. Which... When you state that out loud, it sounds kind of gross. Products like Peloton and the mirror workout thingies. <laughs> Good grief. I'm aging myself like five years just by doing this episode. They're called fitness mirrors. Fitness mirrors. Those wackamadoodles are making digitally focused fitness activities much more accessible. And this generation, the one that's coming into adulthood now, may look to those experiences first. Faith is undergoing a big change in this generation as well, for much the same reasons. For most of us, the center point of the faith experience is some kind of communal worship experience, right? For Christians, for example, the, the church life is generally centered on the Sunday morning worship event. But such large gatherings are not going to be a high priority for this upcoming generation. Again, they're going to engage digitally first. And to them, digital engagement is valid. Virtual experience is increasingly a valid experience, meaning that it's not a proxy for real life experience when, you know, real life experience can't be had. Instead, virtual experience is real life engagement. Now, moving on, here's an interesting set of factoids. During my childhood, I witnessed the fall of the Soviet Union and the rise of a democratic, then increasingly dictatorial Russia. For the class of 2024, Vladimir Putin has always been the leader of Russia. Additionally, Tayyip Erdogan has always been leader of Turkey, and the U.S. military has always been involved in Afghanistan. Also, most of this graduating class was born after September 11th of 2001. So they can't participate in the I remember where I was when the attacks happened discussion. <laughs> I remember where I was. I'll tell you, I was driving to a job at United Airlines, mind you. I was listening to the coverage and immediately I made this mental jump that the newscasters were recounting some event that happened a long time ago. It took me a good hour to process that these events were happening in real time. Kind of a weird experience in cognitive dissonance there. Anyways, the U.S. has always been post 9-11 for the class of 2024. The class of 2024 are willing to pay for their privacy. What a jump in worldview that is. Like my generation jumped onto MySpace and Blogger and then onto Facebook in order to get noticed. This generation they're willing to pay in order to go unnoticed. I mean, there is a jump in mindset, right? For them, privacy is a commodity. So the default setting in their worldview 
is that marketers and researchers are going to get your shopping and surfing behaviors and some of your personal information. It is necessary now to pay in order to limit that information. Like you just assume that everybody knows everything. If you want to hide stuff, you have to pay. Whereas my mindset would be nobody knows a thing about me. Gosh, uh, we probably should do an episode on privacy practices. I feel a little underprepared for this aspect of the world. And, <laughs> and there comes another five years on a my age. Uh, let's move on, shall we? Banned books are an artifact to the class of 2024. <laughs> but Harry Potter has always been banned somewhere in America for their entire lifetimes. <laughs> That's nuts. Who's banning Harry Potter? I feel like that is such a normative part of our culture. I mean, Harry Potter is. It's so mainstream for us. But I'll tell you, when I first entered into professional youth ministry back in the early 2000s, the big hot topic was whether or not we should allow our kids to read Harry Potter books. Because, you know, wizardry and uh, all that stuff. I'm pretty sure we were massively overreacting on that front because I have yet to meet a person who turned towards devil worship due to the influence of Harry Potter. Anyways, uh, get ready for this next factoid. It's the need for personal protection equipment. That is going to drive fashion trends for the younger generation. So get ready because personal coverings are becoming a functional part of regular clothing items. And we're going to see a lot more self-expression in functional PPE items. We see that a bit now with what people have put on their masks. No, there's going to be a lot more. Do you think masks are going to be a permanent thing? I've been wondering about that. In some places, you know, masks are fairly normative. It could happen in the States too, right? Diversity in literature has been a focus for this generation's educational experiences. I can't say that that was the point in my rearing or in my education. I think my educators focused on exposing us to old classics. Like there was lots of Shakespeare and some Homer. I remember The Great Gatsby and Great Expectations. <laughs> uh, lots of books written by white guys. These students today have had an educational experience where books were chosen because they offered alternative viewpoints. So they read Marie Lu, Tomi Adeyemi, Madeline Langle. Additionally, they have been encouraged to be more interactive with texts. And what I mean by that is that in my educational experience, we read the books. In their educational experiences, they read the books, then provide commentary in online forums like Reddit and Goodreads. So they're encouraged to have a much more personal experience with the text. Just a, a minor pedagogical difference between what they experience and what I experienced in education. Another key difference from my generation to this next one, our biggest threats throughout my childhood were communism and nuclear war. And what you were going to do when Hulkamania ran wild on you. Anyway, today, this generation feels the greatest threats are international pandemic and global warming. And they are way more informed about the threats to them than we were about the threats of our childhood. Let's be honest. When I was a kid, we had like a half hour window through which to get world news each day. This generation has grown up in a world of 24-hour access to worldwide news from cross-cultural perspectives, which is pretty nuts, yeah? Uh, here's one thing that hasn't changed, though. Michael Jordan is the greatest of all time. Thanks to the ESPN documentary The Last Dance and the way that COVID held us all captive without live sports, we had ample opportunity to relive the 90s and witness the awesomeness of MJ and the Phil Jackson-led Bulls dynasty of the 90s. On a related note, when I graduated from the University of Iowa in 1998, a kid named Tom Brady was taking over the quarterback position at the University of Michigan. And I hear he's been pretty good, too. So... Yeah, that's a worldview dive on this episode, a mini episode of The Bad Pod. Super informative for me to research. Hope it was uh, slightly informative for you to listen to. 
If so, hit the subscribe button. We've got all kinds of useful stuff here on the Badass Dad Pod and more information for living the best way possible relationally, physically, and financially over at thebadpod.com. And if you want to take the next step, search Facebook for the Bad-Ass Squad. (laughs) That's Bad-Ass Dad Squad. We'd love to have you sharing your worldview in that forum. Until we meet again, my name is Ryan Dunn. You've been awesome. Okay, bye.